What's up peeps and pilots and welcome to this video on the Tekek loop. This is kind of an information video on how to do the loop thingy, what to do and what to see, but it's also a little story about our experience there and something we saw that disturbed us and no one really is talking about. The Tekek loop is one of the loops you can do in Laos with a motorbike or motor scooter. It is pretty much in the center of Laos. The most important thing you need for the Tekek loop is a bike. You can also go by bicycle. We saw a few people do that, but it seems to be a challenge. Uphill, downhill and all this stuff. I have a lot of respect for that, but I will do it. What most of the people do is what we did. They are renting a motor scooter or a motorbike. Normally, we are always looking for a cheap deal. In this case, we did not. The whole loop is about 500 kilometers. I don't know how many miles this is, I'll just pop it in here. <laughs> this time around we decided for a little more expensive rental. It's not like super expensive, I mean this is still Laos, Southeast Asia, it is affordable, not to say cheap. We just didn't want to have any problems with the scooters on the way and we saw a lot of people in the end complaining they bought such a cheap shit. The roads of the loop, on the other hand, are fine. As long as you stay on the main roads, there are not too many gravel roads, it's all concrete, it's cool. There still is kind of a reason why people tell you to drive carefully, and that is pretty much because in the end, everyone will tell you, I was driving carefully. We heard about a lot of people and saw a lot of people that fell from the motor scooter, off the motor scooter, and it's just, usually, you don't have to watch out too much for the locals, but you have to watch out your fellow travelers and there are also a lot of potholes on the road and sometimes there are gravel roads, so you should just try to take care of you, yourself, your surroundings and the fellow tourists around you. One thing you should maybe take care of are the bridges. There are, well, they are actually easy to cross, they're just dodgy looking. The best way is to just somehow get on the bridge and then just drive. Don't think too much about it, you'll work out. Just take a little extra care. You can complete the loop within two to four days and you can do it pretty much three ways. The first way is to start in Takak, go west and then further up north until you reach the main cave, the Konglo cave, and you go back the same way. That's the nicest route, the most scenic, the most enjoyable one, but it will probably take you the longest. The second option is what we did. After the Congo cave, we had further east, back down south. And the third option, which doesn't make too much sense in my opinion, is that you start in Takak, directly go east, and then to the Congo cave, and go back the same day. If you're really close on time and you don't feel like enjoying the loop, you can do that. I wouldn't advise it because the loop is lovely. You should take your time. the sightseeing things are caves and when it's about caves I'm not much of a fan I mean yes and just to give you a feeling how many caves there are it's like the Buddha cave the elephant cave the Xing Peng cave is it called the Pasu Wang cave Xiang Leap cave Tam Pa Nai In An cave Tam Nang N cave we are not too much of binge watching, binge visiting, binge experiencing, however you want to call that, tourists. So we rather pick single experiences and do that. For instance, the Dragon Cave. absolutely recommend this one. The Congo cave is just, it is impressive because it's so massive. It's like a tunnel underneath a huge mountain that connected two villages in the old days. That was pretty cool and amazing. Just take your headlights with you or you have to buy one. 
Um, all of us went out just a moment we entered the boat. That was that was was a bummer. So that's all that. And now I want to talk about the thing no one is really talking about and that... You may have already seen it in some parts of the B-roll. We didn't think too much about it in the beginning. Then on our way to the first stay, it just got more and more of those trees and it kind of became a natural environment just seeing all those poles sticking out of the waters. We even watched the sunset full with those around. We decided to ask the next day and we asked the owner of our guest house and he explained to us that all this was caused by a hydroelectric dam close by that is producing power for the local area. That, is, by the way, sounds absolutely cool and sustainable and all that and I mean um, they're producing power for an area we heard before a few years ago didn't have too much electricity and definitely no Wi-Fi by the time we visited the Tekaku you had everything there but the dam just dams up water and it starts flooding the area and dams in general are influencing the natural flow of water and I don't want to get too much into detail but it just basically means that if you build a dam you will most probably, not most probably, for sure influence the life around the world and that does not only occur to animals and plants but also to humans, to local people living close to the water. By the way, I had to educate myself on this. I didn't know that dams are causing a lot of problems to the natural environment. I mean, there are people going so far as saying that dams are built to fail. For me, it is really difficult to make up an opinion about that. It's that even if you read about it on blogs or articles, there's not so much about it. People are just get somehow amazed by those dead trees, kind of thinking about them as a natural part of, of the attraction. Of, of the sightseeing, whatever you want to call it, but it is not natural to see that trees around. I just imagine your home would look like this. You would go out the door and it is full of those dab stumpy poles. It is somehow disturbing for me. I don't, I don't know. It, it still makes me think. And the reaction of most people makes me think, even our reaction, because we just took it as it were. I'm just asking myself, is that us? Those people, generations, simply accepting everything without questioning, even if it disturbs us. Admiring or appreciating things, maybe because we don't know in what other way to react, but maybe because we're not interested in just missing out on a lot of those facts. But on the other hand, I'm also asking, do we always need to fight against something that's influencing the natural environment or are we just too stubborn to accept that maybe we need to change, maybe we need to adapt? The answer to all that is I don't know. I'm not smart enough to come up with an alternative or a solution. I literally don't know. What I know on the other hand is that I kind of feel betrayed and hurt finding out that hydropower is not as good and green as, and as sustainable as some people preach because I don't get educated about it. We don't get educated about shit sometimes, that's how I feel. And I want to know about these things and one thing I also know is that I want to see more of them and shed some light on it to understand more and judge less. Thanks for listening.